My name is Howard Hayden. I am a retired professor of physics from the University of Connecticut. I have an interest in energy that actually goes back to my college days. I wrote my first paper about energy back in uh, about 1981 or so. And uh, I gave a talk here about, let's call it the follies of renewable energy. No? No, nope, there's nope. nothing. No, there's Just straight out oil and uh, straight out oil, gas, coal, nuclear, uh, hydro, uh, a certain amount of biomass, but that's not uh, not really extendable very much because they're not very productive. They only produce uh, at best something like a watt per square meter, thermal watt per square meter, of land uh, on year-round average, and. Uh, that actually is more or less the same as you get out of uh, wind turbines. The wind turbine power <clears throat> uh, goes up. Uh, it's proportional to the square of the diameter. But so if you double the diameter, you get four times as much power. But you have to put your turbines then twice as far away in both directions. And that means that the power per unit land area is independent of the size of the turbine, and all of the wind farms around the world, and I've got lists of probably 50 of them or something like that, they all average uh, somewhere around uh, uh, five kilowatts an acre, 12 and a half kilowatts per hectare. So it's not well, all what's impressive. What's the cost when those, when those continue to fail, as they seem to have failed in Holland? <clears throat> well, um, let me put it this way, that the main problem with the failure of the wind turbines is the gearing because they need to scale up something like 15 RPM to hundreds of RPM and that speed up in the RPM uh, is very bad on gearboxes and sometimes they fail. Uh, on the other hand, you can develop a kind of a wind turbine that has a larger diameter but it has a whole bunch of uh, permanent magnets uh, the, say using the rare earth elements, so that uh, they can they can go at, at normal, you know, 15 rpm speed and generate electricity. So I regard that as an engineering, if engineering problem to be overcome, and it'll probably be overcome when they do that. Uh, the, the bigger problem is the uh, the low power density available for wind farms. There's just nothing you can do about it. And then the other one is the, <coughs> the, uh, the, the highly variable uh, power with, with wind speed. Uh, primarily you make a 10% change in the wind speed, you make a 30% change in the power. Or alternatively, if you say the wind speed goes from 10 miles an hour to 20, the power goes up by a factor of eight. Or if it goes from 20 down to 10, the power goes down by a factor of eight. So uh, the grid simply cannot take the high, you know, the rapid fluctuation uh, in, in the power. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to have steady power, you can't have wind turbines. I mean, they can't, at least in numerous wind turbines. Okay. There's a notion of uh, storing up uh, energy from these <clears throat> more viable in terms of uh, steam and so forth. Is that Factor. Well, if you if you could store the energy, that would be absolutely wonderful. But you could also store energy from your baseload power supplies, which are nukes and coal and so forth. And that way, you would be providing cheaper uh, electricity, you know, for the peak time, rather than have to buy it off the peak units. So that technology, yes, it would work for for the variable sources like. Uh, uh, solar and wind, but it also worked for the steady state power. It worked very nicely and cheaper. L let, me, l let me explain something uh, from Al Gore's movie, which you probably remember, I mean, you probably saw that. Al Gore showed the temperature going up and down over the last uh, seven or 800,000 years. The temperature and CO2 are going up and down more or less uh, together. The question that he did not ask nor answer was, 
why did the CO2 go down if it, if reducing CO2 calls, caused the temperature to go down, why did it go down? Where did it go? When the CO2 came up and, this, and the temperature came up, where did the CO2 come from and why? And in fact, if you look closely at the data, which he did not do, for every case where they have the ability, the, the temporal ability to uh, look you know, a detail at the time axis, the temperature changes always occurred before the CO2 changes. And unless you're into retroactive causality, it just doesn't make any sense. Yes, there is a, there is a greenhouse effect due to CO2. It's very small. It's not big. And uh, <clears throat> to what the, does it especially concern you that the population Younger people, right on down to grade school, kindergarten, and so forth, are being told this uh, is basically a lie about how climate works. Yes, it bothers it bothers me very much. Uh, schools should not be propaganda machines, and the EPA and such people, uh, powered by their bosses, are turning the education into a propaganda machine, and I find that appalling. Um, one of the uh, proposals to mitigate the supposed global warming uh, has been put forth by David Keith at Harvard and he talks about geoengineering as a, a mechanism to lower is to, to uh, uh, increase the albedo of the Sun by reflecting uh, the Sun off the clouds mm -hmm. what do you think of that uh, proposal that he's made? <coughs> well uh, a couple of things about it one of them is uh, uh, there's probably a better way to do it than that and that would be to fertilize the oceans because you see when CO2 goes into the ocean and the, the plankton take the CO2 out of the ocean and become plant life but they really lack other nutrition. You put iron in the ocean and all of a sudden you increase the rate at which the plankton absorb the CO2. I think that would be a lot cheaper. Uh, secondly uh, the long-term effect, the long-term thing that's going on is that the Earth is cooling. It has been cooling uh, <clears throat> because of what's called the Milankovitch cycles. Uh, they're getting less and less just by gradual amounts uh, of sunlight above 65 degrees north. And you take a look at the, the um, glaciers that we have, uh, they're getting less and less just by gradual amounts uh, of sunlight above 65 degrees north. And you take a look at the, the um, glaciers that we have. Did you know that we don't have any glaciers up here in the northern hemisphere that are older than about 8,000 years? All those glaciers are not something left over from the past ice age. They're new. They have been forming as the Earth has been cooling down. And the Milankovitch cycles tell us that eventually the Earth is going to go into this deep freeze again, which has spent, has spent 90 percent of the time in deep freeze over the last several hundred thousand years. It spent 90 percent of its time there in these uh, deep freezes, and we're headed for one. And if CO2 can help stave us off from that a little bit, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. On a short-term basis, uh, you know, the Earth might warm up and might cool down and so forth, but the long-term thing over uh, several thousand years, and we don't know when it's going to happen exactly, but the Earth will cool down. Uh, and CO2 in the past has not been able to stave that off. And in fact, during what's called the snowball earth, which was something like uh, uh, 480 million years ago, give or take, I can't remember exactly what the number was, the CO2 level at that time was something like, uh, well, depending on the measurements, uh, eight, 10 times, 20 times what we have now. And that amount of CO2 did not prevent the earth from going into a snowball configuration. And by snowball, I mean 
glaciers at sea level at the equator. You know, that snowball. Mm -hmm. And the CO2 uh, it didn't stave that off at all. The most important thing for them to understand is that the, uh, uh, the science of climate is very, very, very complicated and that it is not settled. And uh, to, to use a, uh, well, let's say, a meme of, um, uh, slips, my main, the slips my mind right now, the gentleman uh, is Canadian. He says that, um, uh, okay, it's Tim Ball. Uh, you remember his name, Tim Ball. He says that climate is a generalist subject. In other words, we have information that we get from artists who are painting things like the frozen Thames. We have information from uh, records of uh, crop failures and good crops, good years and so forth. Uh, we have uh, geology. Uh, we have stories, you know, novels and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we have uh, chemistry. We have some physics. Uh, we have paleontology, biology tells us about past CO2 and so forth. And uh, it is the, uh, the height of arrogance to think that a few guys writing computer programs about nothing more than, than just kind of uh, the way they conceive of the present and the way the atmosphere presently is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the height of arrogance to believe that, that they understand climate. They do not. My idea is uh, just to try and get the science as straight as I can, and the devil will take the hindmost.